effective radiation um, to the to the to the areas and and to the solid tumors, and so we want to try to capture that motion um, using an external surrogate marker and encode deformations using a deep learning approach, and then be able to drive the deformations in a latent space using um, the external surrogate marker, um, and then we would off, off, that would give the opportunity to visualize the motion in real time as the patient is is on the treatment table and also estimate the dose that's actually delivered to each tissue uh, rather than just um, computing planned doses. So this could be a, a big a change in how we do radiation. And, and I'm very excited to work with the IDRA scholars and the IDRA team to learn more approaches and, and share my work. Thank you. Thank you, Ruki. And Briar Sinabdila. Briar. I'm here uh, working on a, a generative model, a deep learning model that's attempting to um, produce a comprehensive resource of stimulus annotations for the English language. Um, basically, uh, it's really, really hard to get measurements of all of the things about words that people study in, in psycholinguistics. So I'm trying to use some computational modeling to, to provide you know, um, all the measurements for all words of English for the first time. Thank you. <clears throat> Abib? Abib is uh, joining yes. Israel. So. Yes. Um, thank you, TV. Uh, hello, everyone. Nice to see so many people here. I'm excited for this event. So uh, I'm a postdoctoral scholar as well at UCLA. I completed my PhD at UCLA uh, a year ago uh, with uh, 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 Professor Jake McWilliams, one of the panelists here, and with Professor Andrew Stewart, uh, working on the uh, overturning circulation in the ocean. And I'm a physical oceanographer. And right now I'm doing my postdoc with uh, Professor Andrew Stewart, still working on the, on the overturn circulation, focusing on the Southern Ocean. So the overturn circulation connects the densest uh, water formed in high latitudes, or it's called, and where the temp low temperature and other conditions form very uh, dense water. And there's sort of a highway uh, of currents which uh, uh, connects different oceans uh, due to these uh, different densities, and it buries anthropogenic uh, CO2 and heat uh, deep in the ocean and so exerts a strong influence on climate. We are trying to understand uh, how these highways are uh, controlled, like they dictated, and what they're like. And there's there's a paucity of information on that. It's very hard to obtain information in the Southern Ocean. And so part of what we're doing is we're trying to use machine learning in order to uh, get more information, some hidden information, which is harder to get to traditional methods from the available observations. Thank you. <clears throat> uh, Cassie? Yeah, hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Casey Youngflash. I am a postdoc with Morgan Tingling, Department of Ecology and Evolutionary Biology. I typically describe myself as a quantitative ecologist, so I am uh, broadly interested in understanding how ecosystems function, how they're responding to global change, let's say climatic change, and what this might tell us about how to conserve these systems. Uh, so to do this, I apply a variety of statistical computational tools, uh, including hierarchical Bayesian models, probably principally that, uh, to large-scale data from a variety of sources. So uh, right now, I'm working on using statistical data integration to quantify how the timing of seasonal ecological events, so think of things like, you know, the beginning of spring, the start of bird migration, how that's changing over time, what that means for ecological processes, and what that might tell us about uh, how we might expect ecosystems to change in the future. Thank you. <clears throat> so, and uh, thanks to all the three scholars uh, and uh, congratulations and welcome aboard. Uh, <clears throat> so the main agenda for today's is uh, the panel discussion on interdisciplinary research and collaboration. We have a fantastic group of researchers who have been actively involved in multidisciplinary activities. So I will introduce uh, uh, one by one all our panelists. Uh, James McWilliam is uh, the Louis B. Slicher Professor of Earth Sciences in Atmospheric and Oceanic Sciences 
an institute for uh, institute of geophysical and planetary sciences he received his phd from harvard his primary areas of research are the fluid dynamics of earth's ocean and at atmosphere professor mac williams is a fellow of the american geophysical union and a member of the us national academy of sciences so thank you james for uh, taking your time karen uh, karen mckinnon is an assistant professor at the institute of the environment and sustainability and department of statistics she received her phd from harvard her research quantifies models and understand climate variability and change using data driven physical and statistical models her work on predictability of heat waves has been covered by news outlets including the new york times fox news and the washington post so thanks uh, karen for uh, coming over a uh, third panelist is jacob foster he is an associate professor in ucla sociology he received his phd from university of calgary he is a computational sociologist interested in social production of collective intelligence the evolutionary dynamics of ideas and the co construction of culture and cognition his empirical work blends computational methods with the qualitative insights from science studies to probe the strategies dispositions and social processes that shape the production and persistence of scientific and technological ideas is uh, you might have heard uh, about ucla data x and uh, that's a big effort within ucla and uh, i guess who is the man behind it is uh, jacob foster is the lead so look forward for the announcement from the institute uh, in uh, uh, the near future so thank you uh, jacob for coming over uh, miriam marlier <coughs> she is an assistant professor of global environmental change in the environmental health sciences department at the ucla fielding school of public health she is phd from columbia university she is an interdisciplinary environmental scientist with a broad interest in examining interactions between environmental change and public health using remote sensing data and interdisciplinary modeling techniques you might have seen a recent ucla news item regarding her receiving an award from google under its new research scholars program which is created to support early career faculty working on cutting edge research across many areas of study including machine learning human uh, human computer interaction earth science and health so thank you all the panelists uh, i'm sure the participants and the audience they will benefit from your insights uh, on the interdisciplinary research and collaborations so the way the discussion will happen is that we have a few questions for the panelists uh, after these questions the participants will have time to ask questions i request all the participants at this time to mute themselves and write questions or comments using the chat box and uh, we will be going through those when we feel appropriate so the first question is a common question to all the panelists and the question is describe your motiva motivation for interdisciplinary collaboration how you started your first collaboration and what the outcomes were so i will start with jacob oh all right uh thank you all so much for being here um this is a really exciting event and i appreciate you taking time out of the busy time of the quarter um first i wanted to just kind of distinguish between interdisciplinary scholarship and interdisciplinary collaboration I myself have been drawn to interdisciplinary scholarship essentially since I was an undergrad I have very broad interests that's one of the reasons in grad school I gravitated to statistical physics and complex systems basically the use of physics ideas and more broadly mathematics and computation to study things that physicists don't usually study and I'd say pretty much everything I've done has been interdisciplinary in the sense of bringing theories or concepts or methods from one disciplinary domain to another and I 
do that for a few reasons. I'm a very curious person. The big questions that interest me don't sit neatly within disciplines. And to be frank, I don't really like doing what other people are doing. And interdisciplinarity is one way to make sure you're generally not doing what other people are doing. Um, thinking more narrowly about interdisciplinary collaboration, I do that for two reasons. First, such collaboration requires deep trust. So I generally approach it um, not instrumentally, but I choose to work with people that I like personally. That's just my own preference. And once we're in a collaboration, I'm motivated by the desire to solve a problem that requires ideas from multiple disciplines, and of course, by an eagerness to learn from collaborators. I'll just quickly say my first real interdisciplinary collaboration came out of a class I took uh, as a graduate student that was co-taught by a computer scientist and a microbiologist. Um, I worked with one of my friends to develop a simple model of uh, in the context of microbial evolution, the transition to cooperative living of a well-known model organism, Pseudomonas fluorescens. The professor worked with that organism in the lab. So I spent a year working with one of his graduate students, one of his postdocs doing some experiments. That led to a conference presentation. Didn't really go much farther in no small part because I was not very good at doing microbiology experiments, but it laid the groundwork for a lot of the work I do work on evolutionary dynamics of populations, of cultural objects and organizations, niche construction, the tension between cooperation and um, sort of emergence of higher levels of organization and so forth. Uh, I could say many other things, but in the interest of time, I'll just stop there uh, and look forward to the next questions. Um, Miriam. Sure. So my motivation uh, for interdisciplinary collaboration is I would say fundamentally driven by the research questions that I'm interested in. So my research looks at the intersection of environmental change and public health and policy. And so conducting this type of research just truly isn't possible without building these types of collaborations and teams involving many disciplines. Um, as far as my first collaboration, I would say um, that goes back to graduate school. Um, I had an idea for my dissertation work um, that it just required looking outside of my home department. So I was really fortunate to have the support of my primary advisor, as well as an institutional framework um, that in really promoted collaborations related to climate change research. So with this, I built a committee for my dissertation from the ecology department, atmospheric chemistry, as well as public health. And through that experience, I trained with leading experts in each of these fields. Um, and what I really got out of that was making connections between the different fields. Um, and as far as the outcomes, it was a really rich collaboration. And now more than a decade later, I'm, I'm still building um, on, on what I, I first started examining as part of my dissertation work. Thank you. Uh, Karen? Yeah, thanks. Um, I love what both Jacob and Miriam said, so I think I'll actually keep mine brief. But um, just to reemphasize Jacob's point, that there is a difference between doing interdisciplinary thought and interdisciplinary collaborations. And you could, in theory, do interdisciplinary thought, which leads to all these cool questions that maybe haven't been answered before, you know, without collaboration. Um, but I think that those collaborations bring a really important and helpful depth to those different sides of your interdisciplinary thought. Um, for me, you know, in some sense, I, I view anyone doing climate science as automatically doing interdisciplinary work because we just have to draw on so many fields to understand the complex climate system. But for me, the most obvious interdisciplinary collaboration is with statisticians. Um, I would say that I, I got a nice boost into my first direct collaboration there and that I attended a meeting oriented towards, I believe, grad students and postdocs that was focused on bringing climate scientists and statisticians together and someone who I worked with on a project during that meeting is now an ongoing collaborator. We've had maybe four papers together at this point and I just kind of always turn to him as my go-to person who's interested in climate but has a greater and more formal depth in his statistical training than I do based on my backgrounds. Um, so that was kind of my first collaboration that continues and I think that the power of both that collaboration and other ones I've had with, with statisticians in particular is that 
you know, different people with different trainings develop fundamentally different ways of thought. And I think an amazing part of working with folks who come from a different training from you is that you might start explaining a problem you're thinking about and realize that you're actually thinking about it narrowly based on how you've been trained. And these other people can really help you see, you know, other dimensions of that problem or ways of thinking that can be very valuable. Thank you. <clears throat> and James? I would emphasize the collaborative aspect of interdisciplinary or multidisciplinary or cross-disciplinary work. Um, the obvious motivation is an expansion of, of talent and expertise if you're working with someone who is different than yourself. Um, you know, more heads are better than one, usually. Um, I worked collaboratively from the beginning of my career, but the breadth of the collaborations has expanded with scientific maturity. Um, I think to truly work in different disciplines collaboratively with someone you trust and like, I'll echo those words, um, really requires a mastery of your own. And mastery takes time. And so in spite of the fact that all of the panelists except me are conspicuously young, I actually think the best cross-disciplinary work is done when one has achieved a degree of, of maturity and, and from that can think more broadly. Thank you. Uh, there are a few questions. Uh, uh, Maybe uh, we can, uh, do you want to take them now or uh, we can take them at the, towards the end? There are more statements than questions. <laughs> yes. I think uh, there are, uh, so uh, one is uh, how can we cope with the imposter syndrome when we work with a majority of people who have done a different educational pathway than you? Uh, how can we see our value in what we know as we catch up in trying to understand what our peers know? So I can speak quickly to that TV. I think that's a wonderful question, Nina. And for the past few years, I've been running an interdisciplinary summer institute for um, early career researchers who are interested in the study of intelligences from kind of many different disciplinary perspectives. And one of the things that we emphasize and what I would encourage you to sort of hold close to your heart as you engage in um, interdisciplinary collaboration is that with truly interdisciplinary problems, there are facets of that problem where you are the expert and you know aspects of that better than anyone else, especially if, as James said, you come to that collaboration from a position of expertise within your particular discipline. And there are aspects that you won't know as well and where you'll struggle. And in a good collaboration, that's true for different aspects of the problem for each person. Um, and so approaching the collaboration where everyone has that spirit of humility, which is hard for folks, some folks, and particularly, I would say, as someone who is, has a PhD in physics, um, often people who are physicists or mathematicians have a little bit of a harder time being humble about uh, the contributions of people from other disciplines. But that's the kind of disposition that everyone can cultivate and I would urge you to sort of stick to this notion that there are parts of this where your perspective is the unique and most powerful one for understanding that facet of the problem. And hopefully everyone will catch up to understanding that that's how they should be thinking about it. Thank you. Um, so the next question is uh, uh, for Miriam. Um, what are some of the benefits and roles that interdisciplinary research and collaboration play in academia and society? Sure, I, I think that, you know, more, more thinking very broadly, you know, some of the most 
challenging problems that we face, uh, like global climate change, which several of us are involved with studying, I mean, that inherently is going to cross traditional disciplines. So if we're going to look for creative solutions, we're going to need to think about how methods from one discipline can be adapted and applied in these in these new contexts. You know, I also have a, a perhaps a slightly different um, perspective as well, because you know, following my graduate work and postdoc training, I, I worked at a nonprofit think tank for a couple of years before joining UCLA as a faculty member. And through that experience, interdisciplinary research and collaboration was not just encouraged, it was the norm, it was how we operated. And so I think through that experience, you know, I, I did learn a lot about how drawing from these different disciplines and kind of echoing what, what Jacob was just saying that everyone is going to be bringing something to the table and you need to be open and trusting of your team members um, for that. You have a, a lot more opportunities for impact for society uh, and that's both on the research itself and I think also with how different disciplines communicate with society at large. Um, and so it really expands our abilities to get get that research out um, for the public. Anybody want to uh, say something more on that among panelists? Uh, <clears throat> the next question is for Karen. Have you had any collaboration with industry partners? What that look like? Um, I guess the direct answer to that is no. Although, like Miriam, I actually also did work. Well, she was in a nonprofit. I worked in the private sector for a year before coming to UCLA, and so I have had the experience of working in the private sector. But I have not, in my academic life, had the experience with collaborating with the private sector. Um, so uh, I'll just say that I think that there are opportunities out there. And, and for instance, the company that I worked at, um, Descartes Labs, is focused on bringing together large quantities of satellite data and making it very easily accessible, um, a la Google Earth Engine, who I think Miriam has worked with, um, but I think with a few additions and additional foci. Uh, and for instance, they do have a program in which academics can use their platform to more easily do large scale analysis of satellite data, which you know, if you wanted to kind of build your own platform to do that, would actually be quite challenging because the magnitudes of data are very high. So I think especially anyone who's interested in kind of big data, big computing issues, there are a lot of potential um, avenues for collaboration with companies that have a little bit more infrastructure than you tend to have as kind of an individual PI in the university setting. James, you want to add something or maybe? Well, another? my my only industry collaboration has been for movie scripts. Um, people do want to know what the future will look like. Um, I have a, a more negative view that I've you know, had lots of industrial interfaces, particularly on sort of environmental harm issues. And my general sense is one of discouragement that, that the the drive to monetize their activities just ends up essentially stopping, you know, doing serious stuff way too often. And so, you know, I, I climb back up in the tower. I want to put a positive spin on that negative note, which is that I agree that if you're a private company, you have to make money. That's kind of how it works. Um, but also, you know, in some cases, money helps move things forward. And so the question is, you know, can something cool and hopefully good for the world be done that is, if you want to collaborate of interest, ideally to your research group, you know, but can maybe also help move the needle. So I think this is especially relevant for climate change today. You know, I think we all realize we're you know, in kind of a crisis mode and, you know, in as much as it's possible, maybe we need kind of an all hands on deck approach to trying to figure out how to live through climate change for the next, you know, 10, 20 years. Um, and that has a, a 
you know, money component, you know, and you can think about insurance, you can think about, you know, value of assets, you can think about stability of supply chains, um, but it also has importance for human life that we all benefit when these systems are stable and effective and hopefully resilient to climate change. So I think in academia, it's tempting to feel like there's this huge tension between money and peer research and, you know, Perhaps in some cases there can be, but in as much as folks are interested in also applied work that has connections to interesting peer research questions, you know, then there is potentially more alignment there than might be immediately obvious. Um, but I don't, I don't discount your point that you know monetization is something that will always be, you know, in the head of anyone who's working in the private sector as well, and that's something that I think academics should keep in mind when they go in, just so they have their eyes open to, you know, the reality of of the situation. Miriam, Jacob, you want to add something? Yeah, I would just jump in and, and build on what Karen was saying. So my experience working with industry has been through the, the some of the support that Google is providing for academic and nonprofit researchers um, through this platform called Google Earth Engine, which is you basically get to leverage Google's cloud computing resources, which is incredibly useful for long term <coughs> and gl sometimes global satellite or modeling based data sets. Um, and so through this, I mean, they've made this platform free for nonprofits and academic researchers. And so it changes the types of questions that you can even ask because building that type of computational power is is just not feasible when you're looking at your individual lab. Um, so it's it's changed the types of questions that I even ask. The next, uh, oh, I'll, I'll just quickly say something along the lines of the positive aspects of uh, industry collaboration. So. I um, have spent the past year working with a couple of um, scientists uh, in Google's ethical AI team on um, some work sort of exploring how the benchmark data sets that are used in machine learning research are uh, created and used by different researchers and so forth. And it has been an extremely fruitful collaboration we had a giving an, uh, an oral presentation on that work at NeurIPS um, in a couple of months. Um, but, you know, I would say aside from the, the, the two really positive dimensions are, obviously this is a domain where industry has a huge role, something that we actually demonstrate empirically um, in terms of the origin of a lot of the data sets that are used and so forth. Um, and so having the perspective of researchers who are involved in doing that work is very, very important. But the other thing is that it makes a difference in terms of how seriously that work is taken by the broader community to sort of have the imprimatur of, you know, that association with Google involved with the paper. So in many ways, it's quite critical of existing practices. And so it makes it, I mean, you can ask larger points about, well, to what extent is this industry kind of saying, oh, yes, these things we do are bad, but that's not going to really affect what they do. But um, I, I think it does make the work taken, it makes the work be taken more seriously. And really the only difference in working with them and working with academics in the same space uh, is uh, that, you know, we had to submit an early version of the paper for review beforehand um, before we could submit it because they have an internal process. Thank you. <clears throat> now the next question is uh, uh, from James. What are the specific challenges or issues you might encounter in working with researchers from other disciplines? Well, essentially you have to be willing to learn their discipline up to the point that you can both understand and critique. And this is usually not a small investment. Um, I guess my primary interdisciplinary work has been biological. 
and ecological, and these are things that I certainly wasn't trained in and mostly haven't worked in. Um, and it, it is, you know, it takes a substantial investment um, of that. I mean, I noticed that the question of imposters and trust have, has come up again in, in the chat. I think this is an important issue. Two comments there. One is that an important academic or research skill is bullshit detection. Um, and I think, you know, on the whole, we get pretty good at it. Um, and the other is that when I have doubts, um, there's a much wider community of people that I know to some degree that I can sort of ask for assessments um, much wider than, than collaboration. And so sort of checking, you know, on the home reputation of, of people you're working with, if you have doubts is, is, is very effective. Thank you. Miriam, you want to add something? Sure. I, I mean, I think from my own personal experiences, um, you know, a, a couple of challenges that that I've encountered is first, there's different norms in every field for things like publications. And it's very helpful to have those conversations early on. So some fields, for example, you have maybe one primary author, maybe two authors and other fields, you might have a dozen and, you know, depending on those contributions. And so being upfront about that from the beginning can can be helpful. Um, and then to echo a little bit of, of what we've already been talking about, um, you know, some of some of what I've experienced, some challenges are, especially at the beginning, it can be really tricky because everyone's coming with their own expertise. They're using different jargon specific to their disciplines, and it can be hard to understand each other. Um, so I remember working on a project where we had medical doctors, atmospheric chemists, uh, geographers, and our first couple of meetings, it was hard to, to really figure out how we were gonna get to our ultimate goal. Um, but taking that time, having regular meetings, approaching it with humility and trust, it ended up being one of the most positive research experiences that I ever had. Jacob, you want to add something? <clears throat> Karen? So uh, the next question is for Jacob. Uh, can you speak uh, to the importance of diversity in the decision-making process? Uh, I feel somewhat awkward as answering this question as uh, a white man, but um, I will put on my sociologist of science hat and uh, just talk about two things. One is uh, the importance of disciplinary diversity. And the second is the importance of diversi diversity in background, life experiences, sort of demographic characteristics and so forth. Um, on both fronts, there is substantial evidence that uh, that both sort of cognitive diversity in the sense of different disciplinary perspectives, different ways of looking at a problem enhances the ability of a team to make progress on that problem. And there are some beautiful models that suggest that that has to do essentially with the degree of sort of high dimensionality of the problem. So in cases where you're trying to sort of capture something that really isn't cleanly contained in a relatively narrow point of view, then having lots of different ways of slicing the problem and putting that information together um, can sort of improve a group's performance. There is also turning to the, the issue of um, kind of demographic diversity and diversity of life experiences. There's some very beautiful recent work. Um, I would point you to example, uh, for example, to the work of Hofstra et al um, in PNAS on uh, the ways in which 
uh, folks who are from disciplinarily underrepresented groups. So whatever the kind of typical composition is in the discipline, the, these are um, groups that are underrepresented in those disciplines tend to be more innovative, um, but also tend to be less rewarded for innovative contributions. So I think that both highlights an advantage um, and why uh, having sort of diverse identities at the table is an important thing for projects, but also gives all of us, especially all of us who are in positions to you know, decide about who to interview, decide about you know, who to offer jobs to, um, decide what happens with papers and so on to kind of think a little bit about these processes that under reward innovative contributions um, from folks who whose uh, backgrounds are underrepresented. And one mechanism that uh, can play a big role in this is the way, sorry, the innovation side of things is the way that your own life experiences shape the questions that you think are important. Um, and the questions that get asked and the classic example of this, at least one that I use in my own teaching on the sociology of science has to do with biomedicine and the continued, you know, shameful and disastrous under investigation of problems that are, you know, broadly viewed as like women's health problems. And this has to do with the, uh, you know, it was not until I think maybe 20 years ago that there were these explicit requirements with NIH grants to justify the composition of a sample and so on and so forth. And, you know, this surely has something to do with what the dominant background of the people who were doing that biomedical research was and um, what those folks thought was an important problem to be investigated. And so I think that's, you know, something that I certainly am very uh, sensitive to and passionate about as like why uh, the multiple kinds of diversity are so important because I just recognize that the things that I think are important problems are a very small fraction shaped by my own sort of standpoint and location and social position and that there's a lot of really important stuff that falls out of there. And so it's great to work with folks who see what those problems are, point them out, um, and then we can work on them together. Thank you. <clears throat> James, you want to add something on that? I'll just say hooray. There's, there's sort of a long truism in, in scientific culture that that it is outsiders who bring in innovation, that usually the prevailing culture is kind of stuck in its ruts, it's busy rewarding itself, but you know, ventilation brings in fresh air. Medium. <clears throat> Karen. Just wanna make one point on the kind of important problems thing that Jacob you know, brought up and, and this connects to someone else asking early on, I think, how do we think of, you know, unique problems? And I, you know, in, in some sense, the hardest part in doing science or, you know, whatever field you're in is trying to decide what you actually want to look at. I mean, there's an infinite number of things you could study and you have to decide, you know, where do I want to spend my time? And so even though we maybe don't talk about that component of the research process as much, I think that is a case where, you know, coming in and really you know, embracing your own background and experiences and interests in terms of deciding what path you want to take and choosing your research problems, you know, is really valuable. Um, and I think that, you know, when, when I actually talked about this recently, I think that, you know, I see in my field, for instance, there's like canonical important problems in climate science. And these are certainly important problems, but they are not the only problems. And there's a diversity of interesting paths of inquiry we could go down. Um, and, you know, I, I think that, when you often read, you know, biographies or stories of people who were traditionally underrepresented in their field, but then did really interesting, innovative work, often early on, there was a piece where they said, oh, I'm just interested in this thing. I'm interested in wavelets or I'm interested in, you know, whatever it is. Um, and that took them on a career path that maybe was a little bumpier than it would have been if they'd gone for the traditional important questions. 
but then they ended up doing phenomenal work because they trusted that instinct. Um, so I think in, there's always this balance in science and an inquiry between, you know, you kind of do want a little bit of imposter syndrome, I think, because you don't want to be too confident in yourself ever. If you are too confident in yourself, something else might be wrong. Um, but at the same time, you also want to be able to kind of you know, trust your instincts and let those take you in interesting ways. Um, and I think that's true, you know, that's easier to do if you're a PI, but I think that can be true ideally even, you know, as if you're a graduate student, um, hopefully your PI gives you the flexibility to have, you know, some of that leeway to, to take your lines of inquiry in, in new and interesting ways. So, uh, I think there is a one question in the chat box. Uh, how can you apply for grants? for interdisciplinary projects are not most grant reviewing committees very complain, uh, contained in a single discipline. So anybody want to answer that? No. So far I pretend that they're, oh, sorry, I'll briefly say, I pretend that they're disciplinary, uh, but, but that's maybe because I can kind of hide my interdisciplinary side relatively easily, but someone like Miriam may have, you know, more, more experience and things that are spanning a ton of disciplines and you can't quite hide that so much, but you can choose what to focus on in the grant application and you can really emphasize, you know, the relevant discipline that you're applying for. Selective emphasis is a good technique. Um, but a lot of agencies these days are putting out specifically interdisciplinary or cross-disciplinary calls. That's particularly true in sort of climate and environment. Um, a lot of the NOAA programs these days are deliberately that way. And I think you, you either need to look like a discipline or you need to respond to a specific interdisciplinary opportunity to have relatively good chance. That's a very good point. Currently, there is a call out from NSF that's for the AI institutes. It has five teams, if I remember, and all are very interdisciplinary in nature. Yeah, and I would just add to this that sometimes you might need to think outside the box as well. So we've had success in the past with looking, um, you know, applying to foundations who might have a different perspective on interdisciplinary collaborations. And I think, you know, a point that was briefly brought up earlier that I'd like to emphasize as well is the importance of internal support too. So often if there are seed grants that the university supports uh, to build those collaborations, you can have a preliminary track record of success. And then when you're applying to a more traditional uh, you know, support from a government agency or even from a foundation, you can show that you've already started on these collaborations, you've started preliminary work, and then talk about how you're gonna build on that. Um, so I think, yeah, I, I would encourage people to think outside the box. I just will quickly plus one uh, Miriam's point about foundations. I would say a lot of foundations have been much faster than the federal funders in understanding the ways that uh, conventional review processes are actually uh, very corrosive to uh, selecting interdisciplinary work and indeed innovative work in general. They're very good at identifying very strong normal science research, but not so good because of the way that, because they're so competitive, essentially like one person really disliking your proposal in a panel review can kind of sink it. And um, a lot of funders, the Gates Foundation, I think was one of the first to do this, have adopted processes that make it easier for um, more uh, unusual work, which some interdisciplinary work certainly can tend to be to get funded if people are excited by it. So that's another thing to look at is like, what are the processes they're using? Have they actually thought about how their solicitation and evaluation processes may be supportive of or challenging for interdisciplinary work? Uh, another uh, question that's uh, interesting, I, I think that uh, is uh, 
very important for the early career researchers and it is in the chat box. As a trainee in life sciences, uh, life science, most of the time, the interdisciplinary work initiated by the PI, such as collaboration with labs. Do the panelists have experience for experience uh, or know any example that the collaboration was initiated by the trainee? Do you encourage the trainees to seek for such collaborations? I always have this uh, trouble to keep balance on to be focused and to be open-minded. That's from Dion Huang. So anybody want to hang it on that? Well, I think there's actually a big difference also in collaboration when you do if you will, cheap research like my own, which involves a computer and someone's brain coding the computer versus expensive research that involves these things called labs that I tried to avoid stepping into myself. Um, I think that when you work in a lab, it's harder because there's so many resources you need to do the type of experiments that you're going to do. And so it's probably harder to, to diversify because you're kind of constrained by that lab setup. Um, whereas I think when you, for folks who do more computational work, um, it's it's not as hard because there's no kind of you know monetary limitations really in, in broadening your horizons. Um, and just for an example, so uh, I have a grad student Sam who's finishing up this year, and um, he's a statistician. He's especially interested in spatial statistics, hierarchical Bayesian models. And uh, I asked him to work on a project modeling ocean heat content, which is essentially an oceanography problem, but has a lot of statistical challenges. Um, so that basically required him to, as Jim mentioned earlier, you know, learn a lot about another field that was not his own. Um, and in doing that, he basically ended up finding and connecting with, you know, a bunch of physical oceanographers who are more statistically minded uh, through a virtual um, reading group and kind of learning from them and being able to share his research with them. So I won't say that he, you know, solely sought out the interdisciplinary problem because I had proposed it initially, but he was able to, this kind of became easier in the pandemic actually, you know, spread out and kind of, you know, connect to people that were in a different field and learn more from them that helped move his research forward. So uh, we do have a lot of questions, but uh, I think in the interest of time and to give chance to the audience, uh, I would uh, like them to ask questions. So uh, please raise your hand and I will go uh, first come first serve basis. You can raise your hand by uh, putting, uh, selecting the reaction. Uh, Menu. While we're waiting for questions, I might just build on what Karen was saying. Yes. Um, so another opportunity for really, um, you know, more early career researcher initiated interdisciplinary work um, is to apply for some of the funding opportunities to support your own work. Um, so I was fortunate to have support from NSF for my graduate um, dissertation. And so through that, I was bringing my own funding. And so then when I went to people, you know, potential mentors at NASA and at the School of Public Health, I was coming with funding for my own project. And they were more than happy to collaborate and to offer their expertise. Um, but that can be another avenue as well. And I mean, that is a, an example of how federal agencies are supporting interdisciplinary work. Because I, I had an idea, I got the funding, and then I was able to bring it to a team of people from across the university and, and get their, um, their support and advice. So we have one hand, Rui. Yeah. Hi, uh, thank you very much for the panel. Um, I have a question about um, how uh, we should align the different timelines uh, between the collaborators from different backgrounds, um, because the progresses um, in different disciplines would be different. 
Um, and for example, if it's a need more experiment um, for further data collection in validating some of the result, it probably were taking longer. Um, while like the research interest in your collaborators field has already been shifted when you update it with more result. Um, I'm just wondering like whether that scenario has been happened to you. Uh, and if it has, um, how you cope with that. I just have a yeah, brief comment on it. I haven't had that exact scenario, but I have had one that is functionally the same, which is that one you know, part of the team for reasons of like teaching commitments, for example, is not able to work on a project for you know, six months or something and then can come in later. And so it's effectively the same idea if it's one part of the project or one person in the project is gonna take a longer time to you know, come, come to contribute to it. Uh, and I think the key, and I think this was brought up early on, is just clear communication. I think Miriam brought it up for authorship, but it's the same, I think, for timeline. It's just clear communication from day one. So saying, you know, if I'm part of this project, we need to acknowledge that my part is going to take a year of experiments, you know, and I, you know, I need people to wait for those to get done, and then we can do the analysis. Um, but, you know, it's, we, we can't do that out of order or, you know, whatever the issue is, and then make sure that all your collaborators are on board on that timeline from day one. And in particular, if you need data analysis collaborators that they believe they'll be available to do the work a year from now, um, you know, and then in academia, you know, we do tend to have pretty long timelines and things are often somewhat predictable. And so if you have collaborators you trust, that brings back this trust idea, you know, I think you can just make sure that you, you know, you're on the same page, you trust them and that's communicated from the beginning. Um, and I think this also connects to the authorship part. So, you know, again, if like a paper is really, you know, 50% doing something in the lab and 50% data analysis, you know, from, I think from the beginning, you really need to decide, is there a way that, you know, we can both have a first author paper that we can kind of maybe divide the results in two ways that we both kind of get credit? Or are we in fields where two first author papers Sorry, what I mean is having a paper with two first authors is actually recognized, you know, because again, there's there's these different norms, different fields about what kind of papers mean and what author order means. Um, and, you know, unfortunately in academia, that, that stuff does become important because it's all about how you're getting credit for your work. So I imagine, especially when there's these very different timelines and skill sets, you know, really establishing what authorship means from, from early on will be helpful. Thank you. Thank you very much. Right. You need to unmute yourself. Yeah. Uh, so I, I have a I have a question. So I have done a very interdisciplinary PhD, and what I've found is that my committee loves me. People I work with love me, but hiring committees hate me. <laughs> they always rank basically a, a, a disciplinary specialist above me. So I'm curious about perspectives on the job market for people with interdisciplinary interdisciplinary backgrounds. I have a thought, but I feel like I've been talking too much and I'm, I feel like Miriam must also have a thought, but I don't want to put you on the spot. No, I can, I can start things off. I mean, I would say it's a challenge, but it can also be a strength. And so there are certain departments that will lend themselves better than others to, to researchers with interdisciplinary training. And I, so I think that's an important point. And it's also if you look outside of academia, so the nonprofit that I, I worked for before coming to UCLA, that was that was what was expected. So if you know if you're looking to stay in academia, I would say you need to think about which departments are open to having people with that type of expertise. I mean, I also think it's fundamentally something that's starting to shift a little bit, but there's still, we can still make go a long way with making sure that hiring committees and promotion is, is thinking through the challenges of interdisciplinary work and the benefits of that. Um, but then also recognizing that outside of academia as well, um, there are opportunities as well where interdisciplinary work is more exciting than having really deep focused experience on a single discipline. I'd love to hear what others have to think. Well, the remark I would add is that hiring committees give much more weight to accomplishments 
than intentions. Um, and I think that in the end is, is far more determinative than, than the sort of narrowness or breadth of, of the work. Um, obviously, there's a question of, of overlap with the department in a Venn diagram sense. People aren't going to appoint outside activities, but I think interdisciplinarity in and of itself is not a disadvantage, assuming you've actually done something. I think it is a disadvantage actually uh, <laughs> for most places at this point, uh, because you know, let's say you're between fields A and B, department A says we would love if department B hired you and we could collaborate and department B says we would love if department A hired you and we could collaborate, but then neither of them decide to hire you. But I think that the silver lining is that, um, well, the cloud is that it might take you longer to get your job that you want. I think the silver lining is that you'll end up at an institution that supports interdisciplinary work. Um, so UCLA, I think, is you know far and beyond a greater supporter of interdisciplinary research than any other university I'm aware of. Um, I have not spent time at you know many universities, but you know I just think that it stands out really uniquely, and that there's a lot of joint hires, there's a lot of joint institutes. You know, it really is a focus of of the university, um, and so I think that the the benefit of maybe going through a slightly longer process is that you end up being in a place that actually wants you there rather than wanting you to be in either field A or field B. My, my own experience has been that it's very hard to discern in advance what departments will like <laughs> the kind of work that you do. So, you know, I, could make a plausible case for myself in like five or six different basic disciplinary constellations. And I did that when I was on the job market and I basically interviewed for like one or two jobs in most of those different constellations. And one of the great pieces of advice I was given by um, one of my mentors is just to make the best case for yourself that you can but don't try to like twist what you do excessively to try to anticipate what this department wants. If they, if you do that and they hire you, then they expect you to be this thing and you are trying to perform that thing and it's just no one is going to be happy. So as Karen said, the happy outcome is that you end up in a place where it's an amazing fit. Um, and that can take more time. And, you know, being a postdoc is, it, uh, oh, it's fantastic that there are disciplines where you can be a postdoc for a while. I mean, I was a postdoc for three years. Um, but, uh, you know, I think my main advice is, you know, pitch your exciting vision and apply, n never, ex never, uh, exclude yourself from applying for a job because you're like, mm, I don't think that I'm what they're working for. If you think you can make a case, then I would apply for that job. So I think uh, uh, we are about time. And uh, <clears throat> but, uh, let's thank you all the panelists for their time and uh, insight and uh, these uh, meetings will be regular every month. Uh, so look forward for the announcements. Uh, sign up for our mailing lists and uh, plan on joining those. Uh, uh, I'm very excited about the year long activities that we planned. So look forward for that. And thank you again. Thank you again for uh, panelists for their time and insight. I really appreciate that. Thank you. Well, discussion. Thank you. Cheers, folks. <laughs>